sing for the children, shooting the children. Sing, sing for the teachers who told. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York City jazz singer Veronica Swift on her 2021 CD, This Bitter Earth, and this pandemic world we've been living in. On this new album, she takes on the topics of domestic abuse, racism, and other social issues. It's a follow-up to her 2019 Mac Avenue Records debut called Confessions. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation about her career, this album, COVID, and so much more. Enjoy. You know, a few years ago that we did interviews, so it's great to catch back oh, up yeah. with you. And, no, I, um, I remember your name, yeah. And I remember we did something way back, yeah. Yeah, well, and when I got your album and I saw kind of the black and white imagery, it's a very deep contrast to the previous album, and I think This Bitter Earth is probably a good summary of what we've all kind of felt over the last yeah. year with this cold yeah. of no live jazz, so... Um, how and the you ironic been doing? thing, the ironic thing was that I came up with that that entire album concept, songs and arrangements and everything. I came up with that years before this all happened. Wow! And, you know, I always I always do that. I have like five or six album concepts ready to go, and all I'd have to do is just rehearse and record them, and then you know put out the record. It's no time, you know, spent uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing. That's not me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But and I just find the right time, and this was the right time to release it. So. Yeah, it certainly was. How have you been doing during the the whole shutdown and just the American Revolution? I don't know, man. I'm, I've been I working agree. on my film. I've been working on other creative endeavors that I haven't had the time to work on before because I was touring so much. And I've been I've actually been enjoying just being able to kind of just chill out. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm struggling. We're all struggling money wise, but I, I have enough saved that I can kind of just ride this wave. You know, and I, I guess that's the thing that I've noticed. I've been pretty consistent with talking to musicians since this started yeah. last March, and I think there's such a wide swath of, of responses that you get, but I think for a lot of musicians, it's a whirlwind. I mean, your life is typically right. a gig-filled whirlwind, and it's like finally now the earth has slowed down and everybody has this time to really look in the mirror and to really yeah. figure their lives out, you know? Yeah, and I mean... Especially when you're in your 20s, like, you don't know what your life's going to be like, you know. And then this time, really, the last few years, I've just been, not including last year, but, you know, the last, the first few years out of college, I just was touring so much and working so hard and actually too hard. You know, in your 20s, you should be having fun and, and kind of just, you know, building your career. But you shouldn't, like, my life was only my career, and that's not good. And I needed to, you know find the balance and if I could just have like what last year was and then like the last year before that if I could have the medium between the two that's that's my that's how I want to spend my time well you're you're talking to a Libra so I I live that every day oh, yeah Chris Bodie <laughs> and Winton are Libras <laughs> interesting yeah hard. And, well and and I think that's the thing that maybe a lot of musicians maybe that's the silver lining of this time is like finding I this agree. You know, this diversified relevancy of your artistic pursuit in life. So it's not all just one thing because I think yeah, no matter yeah. W- yeah, no matter what you do, if you don't strike some balance into like what you're doing versus what you're doing to survive, then yeah. it can nah, you're right. get wacky. And yeah. especially as a singer, like the voice, you know, it goes tired if you're getting up at 5 and 6 a.m. for lobby calls and to fly and then to gig the next day. You know, you get the, the the gig the day of flying in. Like, every day like that, your voice, like, my voice was, like, tired, man. I can't, I got to yeah. rest. Got to have that yeah. rest. What do you yeah. miss the most from that old world that we've all left from? What I like to call BC anymore to me is before corona. Yeah, but, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> you know, what do you miss the most? I'll have to say, like, just things like going bowling or... I, I miss being able to, like, go into a bar and just, like, hug people. And I know that, like, some areas of our country, people still do this stuff. But I personally am not comfortable enough yet, and I I hate that because I'm such a, I'm such a you know, free-love, hippie kind of person. I, I love to hug and kiss people and going bowling, going to movie theaters, all that stuff, you know. Just, I, I bet you there's so many people that didn't think they'd miss, didn't know how much, 
those little mundane things would have an effect if it once they went away. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people realize that. I don't. I mean, you know, I hate to say we took advantage of anything because I think the psychological tsunami of what we've all had to go through is pretty yeah. magnanimous. And I think it's it, I think it's uh, asking yeah. a lot for human beings to get browbeaten into saying, well, you know, you had all these things you took advantage of. No, you know, if I'm going to decide to go bowl, it's just a part of this world that it, that exists. Now, am I going to appreciate it more after the fact? Absolutely. Exactly. But at this point, you know, I, at one point in April, I had the TV on and it was it was on mute, and I was watching the CDC say, you know, stay six feet away, don't hug, don't do this, don't do that. And it almost uh-huh. seemed like a Saturday Night Live skit. It was like this I know, parody man. of like, it, it was like this parody of like, what's the opposite of being a kindergartner? It's this. It's yeah. the world. And within weeks. And think about every, the kids that, think about these kids that are going to grow up being afraid, like, yeah. you know, like it's only two years of their life, but those are important years when you're that age. Yeah. And these kids are going to be afraid to like be in contact with people. Yeah. It's terrible, it, it's man. It's insane. Yeah, it really is. And I think, that's the thing about this that, that that gets me is that, you know, the only thing that I will kind of slightly get political about is, is that this could have been avoidable. And I have a, a stepdaughter who's, who's 15, and I have a son who's 16. And I've spent a lot of time with interviews, not this one, because they happen to be in school today, but they listen to a lot of these interviews. And the resounding, you know, timber of all of the voices were very, very positive. But at the end uh-huh. of the day, you know, I, I've been very forthright and I've been, t- I've told my son Miles, it's that I don't understand a lot of things about Corona, like how it transfers, why some people die, want why, why other people don't. But I do know for a hundred percent fact that Donald Trump is the reason why this thing's ravaging on the planet right now. Uh-huh. This could have been avoided. And, uh-huh. and Ob- Obama had two, two waves of this. He had COVID-17 and 18 and stopped them before they got anywhere near our shores. And I said, so at the end of the day, I know that for a fact. And that's the thing that bothers me the most about what's going on right now is that this is something that could have totally been stopped and it, when it wasn't. Yeah. And now the long-term ramifications, we don't even know what that's going to be. And I, I mean, I, I've been overseas twice since this whole thing happened. Once for a gig and one for just hanging out with some, you know, just like family trip stuff. And I just was really, let me see, what the first trip was Italy. That was the gig. I had a gig in Florence. And that was when we thought things were going to kind of open up again because it was summer and we had spent the first five, four months making sure we tried to cut, keep the numbers down. We saw, we just saw a, a drop so then everyone in, in Europe, in Italy, they opened up again, kind of, you know, not to Americans, but I was, you know, I was part of a concert series, so. So when I was in Florence, it was just like, kind of like a dream. I was there for, you know, 120 hours, like, the law. Yeah. You know, crazy. And it was like a dream. I was performing with 80-piece orchestra. I was singing and dancing and tapping and uh, singing opera and jazz and doing all the things and me- I'm playing with incredible musicians from all over the world and then I go back to this but then America is like compared to like, and then I went to England and in England it's like Nazi Germany over there yeah I mean like you can't even get a haircut you know and there's yeah. no shops open except for grocery stores and pharmacies and stuff so it was like incredible the difference between I mean I'm just the year 2019 I went to Paris like five times just to hang out in, the, in between European gigs and I, I want, I just want to, I miss my European friends and I miss Japan and Australia. I miss all these places. And, and I think that's the thing that's weird about all this is that there are, everybody in the world is living a different reality of this. Like I talked to two people from, that lived in France yesterday and they're on lockdown. Like when I'm asking them, what do you think is going to happen? They're like, I, I don't they, they don't even know when things are going to pick back up. But when you start talking yeah. in America, like right now, baseball is going to, their opening day is going to happen in Kansas City on April 1st, which is the most appropriate day in the world. Cause it's all going to still be like, all right, do we believe this or not? And then we had, for the football season, we had like 25% capacity and had one corona case all, all season long. And they're going to have fans in the stands and there's things they're going to start opening back up. I'm starting to see, you know, like, safe gigs that are happening in New York. I'm starting to see some things wake up. Sure. But but 
at the end of the day, still in Europe, though, they're like, you know, uh-uh. It ain't Complete lockdown. Yeah. And another so. thing that makes me mad is, like, you know, you, you look at the tube or the or the subway and or you go into, you know, these shopping malls that are just people are all on top of each other in, like, a Zara or something. And yet yeah. we can't have distance concerts. I guess it's because the concert halls wouldn't be able to make any money and they'd actually lose money at 25%. Like Birdland, is, a lot of jazz clubs and concert halls can't make the money at 25% capacity. They're losing money, actually. Yeah. So yeah. that's why yeah. they're not having concerts for the most part. I get it, but it just makes me mad to see all these people on top of each other in the subway and the, you know, the stores. But yet, like, we can't have distance concerts. It's backwards to me. It, it doesn't make any sense to me either. There's been rules, like... You know, people can go out and eat and drink here, and you got to take your mask off to do it. So you're you're coming in with your mask, but the whole time you're not having it on. Like exactly. So you know, there's so many things that are very strange about all of this that um, just don't just simply don't make any sense. Why certain I know. things are open? I know. You know, I mean, if the NFL can have all these people in in stands doing this for a sport, then why can't live musicians, you know, be doing their thing? I don't know. It's just you exactly. know. Exactly. None of it, none of it adds up. None of it's really added up for me the whole time. Uh, I mean, cases in Kansas City they keep saying are going down, but we've heard this before. I think that's the thing. It's like it wasn't enough that we all felt like we were going to have some chemo and we were going to recover from this, but everybody went back into remission, and now we're going to be gun shy because we don't know whether or not this is going to be a true thing or not. You know, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, it's it's very strange, and I guess the, the bottom line, I think about this with having kids, and I've been very consistent about telling them, you know, we can't stop living. We have to continue doing what we're doing, and no matter what yeah. happens, this is the only thing. That, this is the monopoly that we live in right now, and you can only control what you can control. I can be hopeful. That's the control I have. You know? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. beyond that, whatever decides to biologically get let out on the planet, I can't do anything about, but react yep. to it the way you know but yeah and every musician's like reacted differently and i know that there are people like my friends matt baker and emmett cohen who are just you know doing live streams left and right and they've kind of found their fan base and they found a way to reach them and have the film crew and the lighting crew and all that they've been able to do that that's great that's not me yeah <laughs> i yeah. can't do that and i can't do zoom lessons which has been really painful because i i could be making you know like if I was if I was an entrepreneur, I could be making so much money, but it's not about that for me, and I I can't possibly take someone's money if the lesson isn't going to be, you know, I can't really give you, I can I can't really hear your time feel or your tone production and how you're using your voice over a computer, and there's yeah. latency issues and all that stuff. So that's why I don't teach online lessons. You know, I could be doing a lot more. It's the reasoning why I, I I can't be doing that stuff. It's because of the, what's the reasoning behind it. I like for me, an artist um, needs a stage and a space and people there. That that's what performing is to me. It'll never change. And and I hear that all the time from musicians. There's no way that you're going to be able to replace that live uh, environment, and it's just they it won't happen. You can't do it. Yeah. So. You know, I, I guess, so with this project specifically, this Bitter Earth, what do you want the audience to get from this project? What do you want them to feel from this album? This is not, so like, as opposed to my last record, which was more like a personal narrative, this is just kind of like an observational commentary. Uh, and that goes from, you know, you've heard the album, it goes from the messages to, to uh, political issues. But, but my whole point is that I don't, you know, I wanted to be, my favorite artists were the ones that made, statements without making statements on, you know, they were having an impact, but they weren't alienating their audience by doing so. And I think that's really hard. To, we all, I mean, we all have very strong opinions and, and political beliefs and, and other kinds of ideological beliefs. But our, our, our uh, issue is do we want to put that in our music and how to do it in a way that doesn't alienate your audience. Maybe you do, and that's fine. That's just not the kind of artist I am. And I've been looking and searching for the right combination of tunes that do that, and I think I found that with this record. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, impose my personal, you know, beliefs on people. But in fact, instead, it, it offers kind of like a just an, uh, like an outsider looking in 
uh, perspective. And what I want people to take away from the record is just because of because the record is presented in that with that perspective, I hope people can maybe find a different way to think about things. So as we look forward, you know, uh, the, 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 this question is going to be minced with both reality and hope. What do you hope happens as we move through this year and get closer and closer to getting on stage? How do you and your ideal way of thinking about things, see things happening, whether you have real shows coming up or things that you're hoping for, what are you seeing the future as? I don't see, I don't really, I'm not the kind of person that sees anything happening. I just let it happen and live day by day. But what I hope happens is that we can get, not only get, get back to having live concerts at full capacity and people just, you know, loving each other, but um, I would like to see just a new, uh, a newfound appreciation for the arts because if you look back without fail, looking back in history, whenever there's been times of, you know, trials and tribulations, whether that be uh, social injustices or or any kind of um, war, anything. Music and art are the things that that's what people turn to. And unfortunately, like I, it's hard. It's hard to if that is happening. It's hard to see it because it's all this online stuff. And it, it's um, I mean, I'm I am at least in my New York community, the people have really prevailed finding a, a faith art. And so I just hope that after this, people kind of have like a, you know, we were talking about, you know, sometimes maybe or maybe not people are taking advantage of the fact that, you know, we had all this, all the, you know, all these freedoms available and we didn't have, now we don't have them. So I'm just hoping that in terms of at least my industry, people can come back and just like, wow, I never knew how much I loved this, loved going to concerts and until now or something. You know, that's, I guess for me that's what I hope to see. Yeah, and I guess in a more hyper-specific question, like what do you hope both the audience and the musician gets from this long time away from live music? Chill, like to, to get out of themselves, I think. Um, I, I don't know about audience, but for at least for the musicians, especially the musician, musicians I'm around, we're all in our 20s, and early 30s, it's so easy for us to... I, I don't really get this way, but you know, a, a lot of people, when you're when you're living in the centrifugal universe of everyone coming to see you play and your managers and your agents and working for you and this and that, there's just a lot of there's been a lot of like me energy, and I I'm hoping that this has called upon the musicians at least that that's only, that's what I can speak about because that's the industry I'm in to think outward going forward. Yeah, but yeah, I also think I that's agree. just a part of growing up anyway. You know, you're in your 20s. It's of course it's mostly going to be about you in terms of, you know, you're building your career, you're thinking about yourself and building the base for your future. But, you know, it's good to, to have the other perspective so that you have a full, yeah, yeah rounded. Yeah. Thing. I get it. I totally get it. And I think that's the thing I'm hoping is that when we come back, this appreciation and embracing of the live environment stays around. I mean, we've seen moments of magnanimous things like 9-11 happen in this country and Everybody kind of goes back into their old way, but I think this has been much more permanent, and we still don't know when everything's going to come back, like when that date's going to be. I mean, I'm still interested in to see what this country is going to do to even observe, like, March 12th or 13th this year. Like, that's yeah. a pretty big milestone for this country. That's when things got... That's when got, things got, shut down, right? Yeah, that was the heavy. That was the announcement that this it's going down. So, I'm... I'm there's a lot of things I'm still interested in seeing myself. Hopefully things, um, you know, just get better. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, yep. That's the hope. Yep. So. It's just like, I, I could talk and talk, but really the plain and simple thing is I just hope things get better. <laughs> that's it. That's what yeah. it boils down to. <laughs> that's that's yeah. all we can do. So, well, hey, Veronica, travel safe. Good luck with the album. I know here in the Kansas City market, and even nationally, I've heard a lot of people spinning this. So, uh, and good luck with the return to whatever semblance of the life we used to know. Oh, man, you know. thank you. You too. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest singers and players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Veronica for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, 
Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.